we are here, we are stoic, get used to it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's a, that's a good start. Um, I'm John. And I'm Dre, and this is Voices in the Dark, uh, coming to you, um, well, I was going to, I don't know what I was going to say, you with go Ned, go. our mascot is back with us. He ignored us for a good six months, I think, whilst we're recording, yeah. or possibly we kept locking him out, but now he's decided that because we have a sexy camera, he, that he can be on TV. And he's sitting on the table, so come and watch the video and see Ned also learn how to human. <laughs> Slightly out of focus, because obviously we pointed the focus onto us. That's right, focus right on our million dollar smiles. Or they will be if more people support us on Patreon and we can get that necessary dental work. That is the next goal on our, <laughs> on our Patreon, <laughs> dental work. That's what and we've been do. abandoned by Ned. Oh, no, well. he's fucked off. But we do have video these days on our incredibly sexy cinema grade camera. So come over to voicesinthedark.world and uh, you can watch the video there. And you can see what's on my mug if you're looking on YouTube. Yeah, it's a pretty cool mug. Unicorn tears. Do you think it'll be this will be the call to action that spurs the listeners to yeah, go on YouTube? Like, like looking at my mug. mug. We got to yeah. see this mug. Um, so this is another episode of the Modern Stoic, number fifteen, and the letter we're talking about is on the futility of halfway measures, which I think confirms to me, though I still found it hard to discover for sure, that Seneca didn't write the titles of these letters. I don't imagine that halfway measures is a Latin term. <laughs> Could be wrong. Well, Italian has mezza misura. Well, fuck you. I don't know about Latin, though. Okay. So, nevertheless, I will say whether or not he titled it, this one is about making change. Big theme that we like to come back to because it's one that a lot of us struggle with. Uh, there's always going to be changes throughout life, but often we get paralyzed when we're thinking about it. So this letter is about making change. It could be leaving a job. That's what he's writing to Lucilius about. It could be about changing your life, when to do so and how to do it best, why we cling on and we don't make change, and how we even enslave ourselves to lives that we hate. Um, and he gets into what the inevitable costs are that we do have to pay if we want to make a new and better life for ourselves. It's a pretty cool letter. Solid. 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 Solid as a Seneca. <laughs> um, so thank you, people, for listening. Tell a friend if you think they'll enjoy it. You can help us out, make us smile, and then see our teeth even more on the camera. <laughs> if you can give us an iTunes five-star rating or review, helps a lot, especially since iTunes doesn't show you all the reviews from around the world, only shows you the ones in your country. So ever, we, apart from Rogan, I guess, everyone looks shitter than they are, mm. which is a dick move from Apple. Thanks. Um, and uh, tell you what, if you do leave us a nice five star review and take a screenshot of it and email it to us, you can do so with a problem you're currently facing that you're struggling to be stoic about mm. or 48 laws of power savvy about. And we'll try to give you a good guideline for how to solve it. Yeah, we'll talk about it. We want to have some more uh, mini sods where we address, uh, I guess, letters, e letters from you, the listeners, and we will become your personal counselors for that for that segment so do that get in touch um you can find us on facebook at v in the d and on instagram at v in the d dot pod yes we'll, we, we, we we've spoken at length about what, how, how this makes us feel that we can't have v in the d without the dot pod um, for those rants watch the previous episodes yeah we need we need to repeat <laughs> we need ourselves new, new gimmick um, yeah, and if I mentioned Patreon, there's rewards there. We're making new content. We're brainstorming, putting together some really cool ideas. We're going to make unique episodes and uh, help uh, like share things that we are developing that will later become things that we will um, put a price tag on, but we're going to work out and give for free to the Patreon subscribers. So patreon.com slash V in the D. Interesting times at the moment. I am a porn star. You, you are. <laughs> you wanted to squeeze that in there. I huh? just, uh, it's the thing that's kind of energizing me at the moment. It's an extremely yeah. interesting well, people experience. People give, give everyone shit about, you know, uh, chasing the dopamine hits of uh, social media. But it seems to have revitalized you. It's acting as an antidepressant. I'm fucking <laughs> overloaded with dopamine. It's a good job I still managed to sleep. We're just looking at this, this particular image, which is on Instagram, um, which... Uh, is like I think in less than 24 hours has about 3,000 likes excellent uh, it doesn't it's a, it's a weird mechanism because I don't feel validated by it like oh this means I'm hot I think that would be a terribly bad route to go it's more like 
oh cool i'm part of something interesting that okay. that's yeah, happening that's good reframe good reframe i mean it's, it's pretty good feedback as far as whether or not you're hot though oh, <laughs> i don't think i need their validation okay you in, just know in, i just know <laughs> well it, i mean who cares because um it's not like like valuing the the opinion of, of people that you don't know in any way that's a slippery slope to go down i think yeah i mean not value I mean, it's not no, it's, like, it's not like it, worth if you see one like being taken off it's not like oh <laughs> oh no <laughs> but you know the aggregate positive vibes of over three thousand people going mm -mm, that's mm. gonna be you know pretty fun oh it's nice i just think there is still a distinction that as since this has sort of wandered unexpectedly into my life as some like oh how about this oh that sounds like fun i definitely am conscious of and don't want to be doing such things like doing modeling things having pictures taken and doing it because i want to feel good about myself on the basis of other people giving it a like i want to feel good about it because it's an enjoyable fun let me express right. myself but sometimes i think that you're overly worried about these dangers and pitfalls <laughs> i just don't want it to become some weird okay. addiction you so know? Is, is it really a danger for you do you think I think that it's it's definitely a thing which can be hazardous to your mental health, given that most models that I've met or that I know through other people are really like highly strong. They're not comfortable and confident in themselves. They've got very mm. low self-esteem, which they try and bolster through getting the, the, the dopamine hits of other people telling them they're cool. And but they're my really guess is not that they were cool and calm people that got destroyed by the evils of modeling. I think they were the kind of people that ended up in modeling because that's the way they could chase that dragon. Well, speaking as a professional model, I... <laughs> <laughs> no, you could be right. You could be right. The reason that I think that kind of gets back to my point that the reason you go into it is important. So if they went into it, they weren't like, cool, calm, let's just try this, but more like, I need attention, I need the love. That is determining what's going on. Okay. Well. Anyway, what would Seneca think about all this? <laughs> <laughs> this letter begins with nothing to do with my nudity, which, you know, it's a pretty we, shit letter as a result. Yeah, which, that's why we squeezed the end of this, you know, to the preface? Yeah, a yeah. Pre it could be a preface. Preface. I hate to the that episode. word because it's one of those words that people don't really say. So I've only seen it written. And he goes, preface. preface? <laughs> I think preface is, is often the way. Yeah. Cool. Um, so this letter opens with him going, So, Lucilius, it seems clear to you at this point, surely, that you should remove yourself from depraved and showy pursuits um, and that you want to make change in your life. And theoretically, if Lucilius existed, then he was reasonably high up um, in a particular Roman province, I think Campania, um, and was maybe even like the boss of that area. So clearly he's got a lot of responsibilities, but sounds like he's not too happy about the business of his life or the business within his life. Seneca's, Half my family is from that area. Ooh. You know, managing them, I can guarantee you, will probably be a tough job. <laughs> <laughs> Impossible. <laughs> so Achilles we apparently is like, yeah, I need to make some change. I'm not happy, but he's still wondering how to actually go about it. Um, and Seneca says, well, there's, there's no one answer on when and how to make a big change in your life. He says, the physician, the physician cannot prescribe by letter the proper time for eating or bathing. He must feel the pulse. So if we break that down, and he gives another example I won't quote about, if you're a gladiator, you can train, but it's what happens in the ring that depends when and how you act and what you do, because there is change, there's other people involved. Mm -hmm. So he says, we can formulate general rules and commit them to writing as to what is usually done or ought to be done. Such advice may be given not only to our absent friends, but also to succeeding generations. In regard, however, to that second question, when or how your plan is to be carried out, no one will advise at long range. We must take counsel in the presence of the actual situation. This is kind of fun because it ties right back into the laws of power and some mm. of Robert Greene's work. I think it was a tweet that I retweeted um, two days ago from his official account saying, um, I can't remember the exact wording, but basically prepare and study all the mm. possibilities ahead of time. So when the time to enact your plan comes along, you can strike swiftly. Yes. 
And it is very key that it's not about like, oh, I must act now, what do I do? Like, you know, act, let's act quickly in the moment. It's about having prepared ahead of time fully as if it was going to happen tomorrow so that when it does happen that you might have that up window opportunity mm. you act but it might be that that particular eventuality doesn't happen yeah and so you, that particular plan never gets enacted so you must also have ready all the possible other things i call this little fingering <laughs> <laughs> little fingering in game of thrones <laughs> So that, although it doesn't always work out for him, but he no, tries. No, in the end it didn't, good but it. that was the whole, like, if you look at the beginning, especially in the books of what happens, then you figure out how much he was involved. You can see that he was trying to provoke a war between the Lannisters and the Starks. And it didn't really matter how he got there. He knew that if he played them against each other and, you know... Um, enhance their distrust of each other and put them in situations where they would assume that certain actions were done by each other, mm. that it would precipitate towards a point where that would happen and which then would uh, result in people dying, which then he could, you know, replace with people he trusted and all sorts of uh, downstream effects that he'd already prepared for because his ultimate goal was to destabilize the kingdom, get rid of trusted people around the king, get rid of the king. Like all of that had been thought of and he had possible ways to get there. And But what he needed was to shift the mm. balance so that things would get chaotic enough that he could sort of swim in. Little did he know he was in a George R. R. Martin book and so his <laughs> days were numbered. I I mean I'm sure he's gonna get his come up in, in the book. Mm. But probably not I, in the not way. like that. I don't think it's gonna be like that at all. It was really out of nowhere in the show. He was like, what the fuck? Well it had to happen because they had him up in the north with all the Starks. Like what else could have happened? Uh, yeah, I guess. I just think the show's really got very shit. Like, I'm still along for the ride going, okay, this is sort of fun. I want to see how it plays out. But everything is telescoped so that it's like a caricature of what the narrative ought to be. It's like, let's compress all of this into a two-minute segment and claim that it means something. And it doesn't to me anymore. No, it's lost that depth. Um, you know, you follow it because you've be, you fell in, you've fallen in love with the characters, both evil or good. You want to see what happens to them. I want to see more of Jon Snow's ass. <laughs> That's sure. <laughs> I mean, he definitely worked out for that scene. <laughs> and so you're you're invested, but ultimately you're very invested. It's... Yeah, and you, I mean, they the. It's now been quite a long time. We followed them for like seven years. You know, mm. it's 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 quite a big chunk of our lives that we've like invested in those people, those particular actors portraying characters that we've sort of related to or uh, were upset by. So there's an emotional connection there, even if the quality of the writing has kind of mm. gone sloppy. It actually relates to a theme in in this letter because being invested over time you have this sunken cost fallacy we think well, i put this much into it so even though it's shit now i'm going to keep going with it yeah it happens to me all the time that's one of the things that i have to work on the most um business opportunities which appear great in the beginning but something's not quite right but i'm like oh, I, I, I can work with that yeah i can make do to try and build you know my kingdom to try and build my empire i can make do with a little bit of difficulty you know all the great started out small and, and in a situation where Apart maybe... from Trump. <laughs> <laughs> well, as far as... If you look at it, he diminished his father's fortune. <laughs> if you look at, like, inflation records and stuff. So, I don't know, I don't know if I call him great. Um, what was I going to say? Like, you know, a small, you know, Al Capone started probably someone that, you know, that, that sort of broke legs for somebody else, mm -hmm. you know, like, and maybe he probably had to take a lot of shit for that. So for him to go, no, I'm not going to take any job until it's top mob boss, he wouldn't get anywhere, right? Yeah, for sure. So I struggle with the, is this my rags to riches next step or is this like a wall, impenetrable wall? And because it creeps up slowly, generally. Yeah. Um, it's not like, a, oh, look at all these alarm bells. Don't do this. It won't help. It's more of a, okay, here's a business deal. Cool. Okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to help this client or I'm going to sign this thing. I'm going to do this thing. And then it's like, oh, mm, that, that was a bit weird. The, the person acted in a way that I didn't expect at the end. Okay, well, that's okay. I'll deal with that. And then, you know, then it changes again and then it changes again. I think it, this and is why it's good to have like either a mentor or a sort of consultation figure where someone on the outside can simply look at it without the emotional investment into those things and go, the writing is on the wall. Yeah. It's also why rich people tend to keep getting richer and poor people struggle. Um, it's because a person that's already accumulated wealth or is in a position of privilege doesn't have the, if this doesn't go through, 
I don't know what's next. Hmm. We're like, oh, well, that deal didn't go through. All right, On well, to next to my thing. next venture. But and so there's less of an emotional attachment, which clouds your judgment. Hmm. And there's also like the that, but we can try and adopt that mentality to an extent. Like, yeah. okay, the fuck things are much more on the line now. I might need to pay my rent, that kind of thing. But the mentality of being able to go, this isn't working out. Let's try something else is important. But this whole letter is about being able to understand the transition and when to act. And what I, I liked about that that quote that I read in particular is that he's saying you can have this kind of general rules which can be passed down through generations or we can read in self-help books and so on. But I think that often we we forget that those are the general rules and they're not going to totally apply to you. So I think it's common. You pick up the self-help book, the business book, whatever, and you go, oh, these are the, the 12 steps, 50 steps, a billion steps I have to take. And if I do them, it will work out. But I think it's it's foolish to think that it's definitely going to work out for you personally because this is it's abstracted to a general level. It can't take into account your particular business deal or the personalities that you're working with. So you do need to be able to adapt and grow and learn on the fly with those general principles in mind, which is why we talked about the 48 laws of power at such length for the principles. Yeah. Um, and Seneca adds this, you must be not only present in the body, but watchful in mind, if you would avail yourself of the fleeting opportunity. Accordingly, look about you for the opportunity. If you see it, grasp it, and with all your energy and with all your strength, devote yourself to this task. Mm -hmm. So watchful with the mind, aware, look for the opportunity. Sometimes, though, I think we get we see an opportunity and we're like, oh, I don't think it's the opportunity. I don't think it's the opportunity. But there isn't the opportunity. There's yeah. only opportunities which may become yeah. big things. You, you got to think about it in a little fingery way. <laughs> Let's uh, get little fingering. I, I use that. I mean, also Varus or Tyrion would apply, but Tyrioning or Varusing doesn't quite sound right. Little, little fingering just sounds right. Oh, that right. sounds right, does it? Is that <laughs> what it sounds like? Sounds just right. <laughs> um they don't know how they're going to get to where they want exactly. They know that there's maybe five or six ways and that certain people might, you know, work one against them or for them. Like, it's all kind of up in the air. But they know it's like a game of chess, right? You have a particular strategy in mind, but also you got to take into account the other player. Yeah. Now, you can induce the other player to do certain moves by, you know, thinking about their psychology and trying to make them do something yeah but they're ultimately they're, they're a free agent with free will and so they might act in unpredictably and so your strategy must account for this to have like a very very rigid set of tactics as opposed to an overall strategy is what most people do and why they fail and why the 48 laws of power is such an important book because hmm. it's not rigid it's always telling you you need to be able to flow yeah. the final law which is all about the flow um, interestingly about making change, making this shift when you're watching, you're analyzing, Seneca doesn't say, like, you've got to cut the knot immediately. Find out how you can loosen it and escape, he says. But at the same time, um, some action does have to be taken in the end. He says, no man is so faint-hearted that he would rather hang in suspense forever than drop once and for all. I disagree. I think so many people hang in suspense forever and then because they're scared of the fall they think ah oh, and clearly i'm going to drop i'm going to die i'm going to disappear mm -hmm. and that's when you get to the end of your life filled with regret as so many books and when people do interviews of pe people in hospice care and, and they have these regrets i wish i had tried this i wish i'd taken that risk i wish that i had been willing to be open with someone and tell them how i really felt i think they do hang forever until the point where the drop i guess is going fuck drop into the grave jolly jolly so i yeah i disagree on that i think that however he is point he's he's talking about something very real that is a nearly intolerable sense of tension mm. where you're just like, I don't know if I should, I don't know if I should. He lived in slightly more practical times. Mm -hmm. um, I think less theoretical. And no hospice care. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I, I really don't think people back then could afford to not take action for very long, as long as we can in our lives. We, we can find a nine to five that's boring and unfulfilling. What a way to make a living. And, well, I kind of miss it these days. 
<laughs> what I'm, what, you know, I'll tell you what I miss. I miss the guaranteed income, even if you're ill. So the idea that, like, you know, if you have a mental breakdown, mm-hmm. you can spend a month at home and you get paid. I only, for, only for a certain amount of time, though. Oh, then the government takes in and pays a certain, like, a large percentage of it. It's no, no. Or maybe not for mental health, but uh, for for other illnesses, yes. It's, Up to a point. So I've I had to get into this with someone in 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 the past, and uh, it's really much worse than you think. Oh, okay. I well, mean, I remember someone being on, signed like, off like you, two years off work. You can and... end up on, I think, a disability benefit thing, but in terms of right. I think there's a lot of work to do there and get assessed by the government. But in the first instances, you have a certain amount of sick pay, after which it's cut to like a, a fragment of your of your wages, after which they're just like, you're okay. on your own, fuck you. Well, I mean, to the Amer- to the 80% of our listeners that are, Amer- in fact, American, this will seem even more like e- e- so Socialism. Good. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, what? You get even a few days paid? <laughs> yeah. Um, the socialism dream is real. You guys are getting screwed. In fact, Britain isn't that, even that particularly good at it. No, it's New a Zealand shit country, but... It's so much better for employment law. Uh, my lunch break was included in the number of hours that I got paid for in New Zealand, whereas here it's not. Yeah. Um, so I my learned, eight hour work day was actually a seven hour work day in New Zealand. I just learned that in, in, in Germany, when you, if you leave a job, I think like if you're, if you're laid off and you end up on uh, unemployment, as I guess Americans call it too, you get something like 70% of your salary is paid, your previous salary by the government. And that hangs there for like up to two years. So if say, uh, someone I know goes back to Germany and his job wound up in like about a year ago, he could just go and live in Germany on unemployment at 70% of his previous salary nice. for a period of time. Um, in Italy, that's how pensions work. Hmm. So your last, like, I don't know how many paychecks is what your pensions calculated on, like for the rest of your, your life. I think I want to live in Germany or Italy. So, let's, well, let's certainly go. if we make our millions, like, why not live in Rome or Sardinia or like some, like, like Sardinia is a bit remote, like travel for holidays, Sardinia. I've got it's Sardinian nice. good background, food. according to 23andMe. Yeah, a little bit. So you got to go back to your roots, man. That's right. You got to embrace that culture. I forgot why we got here. Um, people just not making change. Oh, but a couple of steps Please. back. What yeah. I miss about being employed. Yes. Um, it was it was obviously the sick pay and just the general guaranteed income. Um, also, having um, human relations that were compartmentalized, really helpful for my autism. <laughs> like having friends that, however, kind of there was a deadline. <laughs> yes, you know, I occasionally go out for drinks with later, but it's kind it's easier for me to deal with to have like social time like with people with, with lots of people that you don't know too well as mm-hmm. opposed and then i have my loved ones later in the in the day and it ended it did it didn't Did you have just to take it home with you no these days um no matter what i tend to finish like i get into bed the last thing i do before getting into bed is um be just before writing in my journal because I'm, I'm trying to do that last uh, my stoic journal that you gave me thank you welcome the last thing i do is message work shit on my laptop that's not no. healthy no it's not at all at midnight shite fuck that shit fuck that shit man seneca yeah. gonna tell you how to fuck that shit so yeah anyway so that that's what like, i missed that kind of boring stuff but why did i ever go into this tangent i don't <laughs> fucking know mate let's go it, back it was to, part of a point <laughs> oh, fuck maybe it. you can reassemble it out of the okay. detritus later um he says so don't you don't need to rush to change though despite he's him saying that you can't just hang forever that's his view he, he says take you can take a more gentle path he said you don't have to go full steam ahead and make a big show of shit i wish i wasn't in this mess and complain and say it's not your fault and everything like that and then he cites Epicurus, who, uh, in a letter to someone, he was Epicurus was saying, "You should make a hasty retreat before it's too late for you to have the opportunity to do that." But Seneca says that's not the point here, because Epicurus adds, but he uh, adds that one should attempt nothing except at the time when it can be attempted suitably and seasonably, like a time, a place, a situation. And Epicurus forbids us to doze when we are meditating escape. He bids us hope for hurry before the time. Sorry, he, he, bids us, he bids us hope for a safe release 
from even the hardest trials, provided that we are not in too great a hurry before the time, nor too dilatory when the time arrives. That's the hard part, right? Like timing. If, if I was giving, if I if I turned this into an e-learning course, mm -hmm. <laughs> if, if let's Epicurus made his own e-learning course, and this was a module where he said that sentence, people were like, but. How what does that do mean? I keep hope alive without turning it into an anxiety to quickly get out of the situation I'm in? Mm. And Or how do I rein back hope to a level that's manageable without dumbing it down into, you know, um, what's the word I'm looking for? And in essence, I think. <laughs> it's, not in yes it's not acquiescence. It's not acquiescence. No, not that one. <laughs> but, uh, complacency, let's say. Okay. Well, there isn't um, a prescribed answer to that here. Um, I think that's exactly the problem, waiting for this perfect moment. Maybe one way is to think of, try and take yourself out of yourself and imagine that it's somebody else. So you try and distance yourself from the emotional stress and anxiety of it and go, mm. okay, so if this was a friend who was in this situation, what would I advise? How would things look from the outside to them? Let's try and reconstruct this because the problem here is not an inability to understand the situation and the timing itself. It's that it's being clouded by emotion, anxiety, yeah. freaking out. Yeah. So, I mean, in the past, in my youth, <laughs> <laughs> um, when a situ unpleasant situation or a problem would arise, my brain would go, panic, fix this. Mm. Like, what's the way out? What can you do? What can you, like, what, what's the, and that could be helpful if there was a solution, but it, when there isn't a solution, you become like a lab rat in a maze that has no exit, that like yeah. gets to the point that it's so stressed that it just dies. Yeah. Um, and so as I sort of matured and learned things and studied four years of power and other things, I became pretty good at the calm, like, Okay, what can I do? This, this, this. Okay, can I do anything right now? No. How can I learn what I can do? Mm -hmm. You know, like getting into that space. It's it's more of a martial arts master. You know, yeah. with a hundred people coming, like sort of Neo coming when the agents are coming at him at the end of the first movie, and he's so the one that it's no longer like beforehand. He's still fending them off quite well, but from a point of oh my god, I have to put all this effort in it. But then he's like. Whew, Completely mm -hmm. zen. He doesn't even have to try. It just happens. It's being in that space. But that space has a limit. Mm -hmm. So when you're in that space for like, you know, two or three months whilst you wait for your opportunity, <laughs> slowly the, you know, more childlike behavior of like, what if you're stuck here forever? Yeah, like, the fear. You know, creeps up. And that, that erodes at your calm and your composure and it starts to affect you. Like, And having a good mechanism to keep that at bay indefinitely let's say not indefinitely but like let's say it takes you it takes you 10 years to get somewhere if you look at some of the great um sort of from nothing all the way to being the king kind of stories in history mm -hmm. you know sometimes they had to bide their time 10 20 years how the fuck did they keep like like were they crying into their pillow at night maybe, every night you know maybe like, um, I think maybe this is thinking of journals. Maybe this is where a little practice can, can help that if you look at last year, same day and the year before, if it looks exactly the same and you've got the same problems, then I think you're overdue pulling the trigger, like the trigger of some kind to make some change because total stasis and nothing happening is not helping you. Whereas biding your time and trying to set things up to go in a different direction is an action that hopefully is alleviating some of the fear because you can say, okay, well, I'm doing this and I'm doing that and I'm trying to make this change. Yeah. But total stasis is death. Ooh, I don't like that. It reminds me too much of a quote of a man that I don't like. Oh. <laughs> if we're not growing, we're dying. Says who? Hmm? Who says that? The great B. Rose. Oh, fuck B. Rose. <laughs> fuck that shit. He would have stolen that from someone else. Every, anyway. every month that we didn't like get better numbers, that was the, the thing that he would say. And it's not entirely wrong as a concept, but often it's like, okay, what we need to do is this, this, and this. No, we're doing none of that because I don't want to. You want to do this. Like, okay, well then, why do you? Anyway. Anyway. Sidetrack. Let's not give him airtime. They are sort of growing. So, Good luck to them. I don't care. <laughs> um, Seneca says rather playfully that um maybe at this point you'd expect stoicism to say just grin and bear it mate 
That's not a direct quote. But he says, no. <laughs> Can we have that as a t-shirt? <laughs> but that would be false advertising. That's not what Stoicism says. But Yeah, but it's just funny. Okay, we'll put it out under another label. So it Some doesn't... of my favorite internet memes are when people misattribute quotes to historical figures. <laughs> like, like, like there's a picture of Gandhi and it's like, I've got 99 problems, but the bitch ain't one. You know, like those kinds of things. <laughs> or ones that trigger lots of different sci-fi fans, like a picture of Jean-Luc Picard saying, use the force, Harry. <laughs> <laughs> so disturbing on so many levels. Um so stoicism seneca says wouldn't say just grin and bear it mate he says no this is about timing and it's not about complaining and going nuts so he says nay when he sees the dangers uncertainties and hazards in which he was formerly tossed about he will withdraw not turning his back to the foe but falling back little by little to a safe position so it's like withdraw marshal your strength but all the same he says when it comes to business something else is important too from business, however, my dear Lucilius, it is easy to escape if only you will despise the rewards of business. We are held back and kept from escaping by thoughts like these. What then? Shall I leave behind me these great prospects? Shall I depart at the very time of harvest? Shall I have no slaves at my side? No retinue for my litter? No crowd in my reception room? I miss those slaves. I miss those slaves. <laughs> so he, what he's warning about is about being stuck in and waiting when really all that's happening is you're just really attached to the current luxuries and ease and in our modern lives that's where we're like oh but i've got that fixed salary coming in at least i've got that yeah. oh i don't yeah. want to give up my yeah. car yeah. and uh, the opportunity that i just recently left which was no longer an opportunity it was a pit of despair um it was a very very so it turned from being a business that i was buying into to a business that i was essentially uh a, unrecorded employee of getting paid very little with the possibility that in some future when it finally made money again i might get it was basically a enslavement yeah it was indentured servitude and just this oh but you know if i leave i don't have that and you know what if i leave to do something else and i don't have you know enough runway to do that other thing i run out of money or, or, or time and, and so I'm fucked. I better stay here and do it on the side. But then doing it on the side didn't give me enough time to do it well. And so it was a catch twenty two. I was stuck because I was stuck and I couldn't yeah. get out. And, and just realizing that like, oh, I'm doing that thing again. Fuck. <laughs> and props to you for realizing though. I don't think yeah. you need to give yourself a hard time for being in that situation, but better for going you got out of it rather than sticking with it in that little like circle of death are just going round and round yeah but i gotta stop doing that like it's just i don't know how i find these people like, psychopaths yeah well or no it's, i think most of them that either i'm attracted to in some way or they are the kind of people that are more likely to give me opportunity or they're attracted to me in some way people with a narcissistic personality disorder I'm mm -hmm. f I, I, to some degree I th I'm pretty sure most of the people that have been in that position to fuck me over in that particular way that I've suddenly gone, oh, this again, have had that. If you look at the markers of what they do and how they behave. Do you want to outline some of them so people can spot them? Uh, just little things that we can link to an article, which is very good, by someone who I'd like to have on the podcast. This lady has mm -hmm. written a book about them, um, um, primarily from a point of view of, of females. In a, in a relationship, yeah. I think. Yeah, I read that article too. And so little things, that, for example, they, they gaslight you mm -hmm. and usually starts out slowly. So like you do, so for example, in this case, this person said something like, uh, like, oh, it's, you know, it's nice to have you around. Like, and you know, it, it's helpful. And then like under his breath, but clearly loud enough so that I would hear intentionally, but mm -hmm. it was kind of like a, like sort of a throwaway comment, you know, you kind of get more in my way than anything really. But, and then like starts seeing his sentence again. Mm -hmm. Right. And you're like, oh, I'm in his way. I'm and not then helpful. would deny that he'd really said it. Yeah, it's like, no, it was just a joke. But like over a period, and doing it over a period of years, increasingly so, mm. that's that's the mark of the narcissistic personality disorder as well. Increasingly sort of putting you down in a way that you start saying that to yourself. They create the little voice that depressed people have. Mm. They create it in people that weren't necessarily depressed to start with. They give you that demon. And you worry if you're going mad because you're like, oh, you know, they're just joking. Why, why am I getting so hung up about this? Yeah. Um, that's one thing that they do. Something else that they do is they they can't see anything other than how it relates to them and themselves. It's mm -hmm. either for like for them or against them. 
um, they people are either their best friends or their worst enemies. You know, there's no in between usually, mm -hmm. um, and they just. It's just completely wrapped up in their own world. There's like, like there's no self awareness of the fact that they're doing some of these things like ninety percent of the time. They Unless believe. they're if they're clever enough and they also have some sociopath psychopath tendencies, they can weaponize uh, this in a very intentional way. Whereas if it's just NPD, they tend to be harming people almost unintentionally. It's just part of their their kind of DNA. Yeah. They actually get the strength out of putting other people down around them but they're not consciously doing it it's just the way they go i feel good when i do this yeah, sort it's of learned thing. behavior yeah. probably their mother or father was like that mm. um, maybe some mentor figure or co you know colleague reinforced it later in life it just it's how they operate they uh, it's it's just it's vampiring basically and if you're if you're no longer of use to them or they can't draw any strength from from you you don't exist in their world anymore either no. Which and is I, good. And I've seen well, get out. And sometimes they want to destroy you though, or they badmouth mm. you to everybody the moment you're not part of their team. True. Which can harm you professionally if let's say they're like let's say they're they're a high level mentor figure that you were hoping to get something out of in a particular mm. world or industry. Having it would have been better not to become associated with them at all rather than getting a short experience of them because if you leave on bad terms, it could mm. damage you. And this is something that, for example, you see in uh, with the recent sexual scandals as well, mm -hmm. there, there's definitely an, a, a component of, of narcissism in all those men, um, as well as other things. It's not just pure NPD, but the, there is a component of. Uh, sorry. No, I was scratching my lip. Oh, it's I thought you were pointing to, at Nothing my... to do with you. Are you a narcissist? <laughs> yeah, clearly. <laughs> but it was it was like a tappy, in, like enough that I thought. I had, oh, I did had, I get I coffee little, on my mustache? I had mustache? a little itch. Okay. See, there we go. I'm a narcissist. <laughs> You're a total too. narcissist. Maybe man. that's why I keep falling. But what's worse than all these things that they can do to like bad mouth you and do all these practical steps is the fact that if you remain in their sphere, they are mentally destroying you. Yeah, bit yeah. By bit. Uh, it's going to take me a little while to fully recover from that influence, mm -hmm. um, especially because it's like as if I was a battered wife out of one marriage uh, for four or five years with London <laughs> Real, and then. Um, moved into another one, you know, like because it seemed it's familiar. Like it seemed fun, yeah. <laughs> so, like th that, that's just going to hang with me for a little while, um, not in a particularly bad way, but it's something I have to watch out for. Like uh, that, that the demon of maybe that's all you'll be able to do: find these people and like think that it's it's not well, and do repeats. I think in, in part it's because the, you think, oh, okay, I can probably work with anyone. I don't have to like them in particular and they've got their funny ways, but it's I, I don't need to like them to be able to work with them. Whereas perhaps other people escape from this a bit more easily by going, this guy's a dick, fuck him. I don't want to work with him. Okay. It's, not, it's not worth it. You're right. Because for me, I had to go from not working for from, from, from with anyone particularly well in childhood mm. because I didn't like anyone mm. <laughs> to like, okay, well, do I want to get anything done in life? Okay. Well, therefore I have to kind of counteract some of my sort of, um, proclivity is not the right word, right? You could sort of, yeah. But isn't it got a particularly negative connotation? No. Okay. To do with my condition, I have to ease them up and try to find pleasure in working even with people that yeah. in some way grate on me because everybody has at least one thing that grates on me I think <laughs> except the few people that are in my little clan that I hold on to with my heart of hands but even they have got some things that you know if I let that dom if I let that particular thing that they do that I don't like dominate that the idea of who they are. I'm not going to ask. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jesus. No, but I've come a long way. So it's not, mm -hmm. it's not like I have to fight it off all the time mm -hmm. or something. I'm relieved to hear that. <laughs> it's more of a, oh, that's just something that that person sometimes does. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's fine. They don't mean it in a particular bad way. They're my friend, blah, blah, blah. Like th those types of things. Yeah, so you've had to learn it in these ways that have been useful, but now that sort of, you've worked that Maybe muscle. Maybe I've blurred that line too much. Maybe, whereas the guy that you're talking about, I very quickly, after like meeting him one and a half times, I was like, I was, there's no way I could work with this guy. Okay. He's a complete mess and a dick. So maybe I need you as my barometer of like, am I being autistic about this or is that person an asshole? Hmm. 
Maybe. Should I come in like a canary in a cage? Because and- yeah. otherwise I'd be like, okay, I can't work with this person. I can't work with this person. I can't work with this. No, I can't mm-hmm. work with any of them. So maybe I bring you in. I'm like, is this person as bad as I think they are? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think in part it's just about finding people who are actually like decent humans. Like who have a similar, at least sort of some sort of similar moral compass. Who show that they value other people. And when there's no sign of that whatsoever, it's time to get out. Okay. So, yes, Seneca was saying, if it's business, are you just attached to the the luxuries or maybe just the, oh, at least I've got something going on right now. Um, And he says, hence men leave such advantages as these with reluctance. They love the reward of their hardships, but curse the hardships themselves. (laughs) Says everyone going, I fucking hate my job. It sucks, but at least I've got the health insurance. At least I've got the car, blah, blah, blah. Right. And he says, search the minds of those who cry down what they have desired, who talk about escaping from things which they are unable to do without. You will comprehend that they are lingering of their own free will in a situation which they declare they find it hard and wretched to endure. It is so, my dear Lucilius, there are a few men whom slavery there are a few men whom slavery holds fast, but there are many more who hold fast to slavery. Oh, definitely. Because I mean Ultimately, even those taken against their will have sold themselves into slavery. You, there is an opt-out, which is death. Right? A big, big opt-out issue. It's a big opt-out. But uh, technically speaking, no one can make you do anything you don't want to. Because you like, can kill your yourself. Choice. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's it's the ultimate cut. Co- it's the ultimate. Okay. Like, so tap that's out. that's the extreme example. But, but a, it, there's, a way... there's heaps of other cases throughout history where people sold themselves into slavery intentionally to give because they thought it would give their children a more likely secure future than not being sold into slavery. Oh dear. You know, um, and we do this every day. Jobs are like that. If we could run around outside, eating and fucking and like you know just being lazy. I think quite a large proportion of people would do that for at least a little bit. Yeah, and then probably get bored, most of them. But what's so pernicious about the way that we tend to think about work in our culture, our part of the world, is not that, um, okay, I am selling to you, I am bringing the value to you, doing stuff, and you pay me for it, but I'm choosing to do this, and you better treat me good, because otherwise I'm fucking off. Instead, we're like, oh, I've got a job, that means I'm a person, that means I'm getting validation, and I have to have this thing, please look after me. I think the reason we're here is, if you look at history, uh, there is an evolutionary pressure on society to become more rigid in many ways, um, in particular ways. So to leave less room for change Mm -hmm. um, and to leave less room for any empty space as well. So if you look at a farmer from the Middle Ages, you know, they after the harvest, they would basically not work. Yeah, just chill. The, until months. it was ready again to like the land was ready again to be sort of tilled and, and sort of prepared for the next mm-hmm. uh, planting and everything uh, you know unluckily for them this period was during winter so half the time they would just close themselves indoors yeah. and do very little um, but you know that were during that period they would they, they, they you know they would read maybe if they could read or just spend time with their family it's very very different these days we've got constant work and now email has made it so that it's constant even outside of the place of work yeah. You know, you take it with you at all times. And we've pushed people towards careers that are locked in. You know, they can't get out because they're living just with just enough salary to survive one month because rent is so high. Yeah. Like everything is moved to a place where you're locked in. Like we we're designing so society is designing itself to prevent people from changing. And I don't know exactly which parts are pushing for that Mm -hmm. Uh, but there is a clear evolutionary pressure to lock you in more and more laws are becoming more complex in a ways that for example it's harder to start new businesses these days than it used to be all you had to do was go out put a cart out and start selling shit and then someone figured out like oh we better text those people like here here's a crown Mm -hmm. for having the right to be out on the street now before you can start a business in some countries like in italy forget about it no way you can do it. Like there's, you might as well give up unless you got like a hundred grand because it's going to cost you forty grand worth of bureaucracy and right. taxes and shit to start your business on the first year. So unless you can guarantee that you got at least that much coming in, 
done. Like, you know, a little kid trying to start an app and sell it online has to do it as a, like, sort of surreptitiously in Italy. There's no way you can start a business because it will be complicated. Whereas oh, wow. here in the UK, you know, with 14 quid, you can open a company. But even so, you've got tax obligations, you have to file tax returns, you have to do all sorts of other things. Um, yeah, that's scary and intimidating. And it's only increasing. So to try and standardize things, because humans like to have control and expectations and know exactly what's going to happen. They don't like, like, but what if this goes wrong? Mm -hmm. They need to codify it. And that tendency has meant that there is a rigidity that's ever increasing, which will prevent flexibility and flux. This is why some of the let's protect the people rules like from parties that are here to actually try and do good so the left side of government tends to try and want to help people out mm -hmm. um, but they also do things that are bad for society by putting in restrictions for example around small businesses you know regulate the fuck out of people that have billions but don't put the same restrictions on someone that wants to quit their job and start like a small venture selling vape juice out of their living room. For example, we should do that. Um, I agree. And I was thinking of like a related example of the same dynamic. I was talking to our friend Jackie yesterday and she was talking about maybe wanting to get into the realm of psychology as a researcher of some kind. But she'd been looking at university courses and saying that you need, oh, you already need this degree and you need a bit of sciencey stuff and so on. And she said, is that the reality to me? And I said, well, to be honest, from what I've seen on the inside of universities, it may be that you, you can actually just contact some people who run the courses and see if that you make a connection and maybe you have to show them a bit of work you prepare or something. And they could go, yeah, I want to work with this person because clearly there's a good fit. You know, that's how human stuff should work and works best. But I said, the bureaucracy face that you see on the web page saying you need this, this and this, they need to put that there to appease the bureaucrats saying we must have clear de definitions for everything for who can come in and who can't and to give ourselves prestige but it might be that the people who would let you in on the inside are tied up by the bureaucrats that they wouldn't these days be able to get you in because they're like this is a good person and i want to teach them so in you come you'll be faced instead with the bureaucrat um, offices going this is unacceptable you haven't checked these boxes blah 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 and that's happening throughout the education sector that it's checking boxes and jumping through hoops and the hoops have perhaps been placed there with some good intentions like let's try and raise these standards let's try and make sure these bad things don't happen but the best way they can come up with it is this strangely rigid, unhelpful stuff. It's like, we need to reduce crime, so therefore, let's just have more spot checks. Yeah. When did we put administrators in charge of everything, as opposed to have them as advisors? Administrators used to be advisors to the guy that needed to, or girl, that needed to be reined in from making rash decisions. Administrators As opposed are, to the people that made all the rules. Yeah, and what's scary is that the administrators are the most if you're an administrator and listening and you're the exception that's good i'm glad you're listening to this podcast but they are the most brain dead fucks out there they love the fact that they just do a process over and over again you might as well just have a robot except these people are crueler than robots would be <laughs> yeah at least robots are impartial the, these people have petty politic grievances and, and they also they have no conscience because everything is those are just the rules mate there's right. no humanity yeah, so yeah. when i was faced with that in a situation where i had been off sick because of mental health issues and they had not informed me as they were they should have that if you continue being formally signed off then we're gonna like slash your pay and so he's like, oh, yeah, so your job's winding up now. Um, yeah, the, it turns out, in fact, you owe us like two grand, you know, out of nowhere. And I'm like, what? What, what the fuck? You and there was no sense of him going, I'm really sorry, or it was our mistake. We should have communicated better. It's like, this is what it says on the paper. That's how it is. Robot, robot, robot. Yeah. Why? I mean, it's the constant clear struggle of humanity to rather than finding a good spot somewhere in the middle between two things to tend to extremes like rather than let's have some rules but also mm. let's keep our open mind about using them you know judiciously and properly and throw them away, throw them away when they don't serve the purpose that they were created yeah. for suddenly it's like either all the rules or anarchy 
Yeah, it's like, like we, we come to instead worship the fact that there are rules rather than looking at yeah. whether they work. But part of the problem, I think, can be our fault, roughly, that we don't want to do the paperwork. So we give it to the fucktards who love paperwork. Oh, so it's our, oh, that's our, it's our fault for delegating responsibility. Yeah, so basically, it's like a king allowing a nobleman to mint his money. Mm -hmm. Essentially, that's it's it's you've lost sovereignty. That's a really good way of looking about it. Looking at it, so society has been relinquishing key essential sovereignties to people that should not be in charge of them. They should like oh, that's they this is just fucking with my head now. I'm just thinking go. about other places that that's also happened. Like who have we delegated things to? Because they love doing them, that we like, oh, this is boring or a nuisance or completely inhumane. And we've given it to uh, these psychopaths that love, mm -hmm. you know, probably war has been delegated to psychopaths a lot of the time. Certainly a lot of foreign policy advice, think tanks and so on comes down to people. So I know this in relation to Russia in particular. A lot of the advisors that governments bring in are in fact, in fact people who are the least imaginative, most prejudiced, most ass licking, who are basically lowest in their class but are desperate for power mm. and so on. So you go, oh, so you're the expert. Well, I guess we better do what you say. Whilst everybody else in the field who knows more is like, you're listening to them? <laughs> because that's the person, that person was willing to do the job that is unappealing yeah. to many because well, they want to go around glad handing. Putin himself has risen to where he is um, because of his cold, ruthless, you know, um, sort of capabilities within the KGB could you be? It was. And then changed to whatever else it was. Um, in East Germany, right? Yeah, he was in East he Germany there. first. And in particular, we know the anecdote that might have gotten him his top level promotion uh, that we, I don't think we're allowed to share. Someone told us because he studied him in detail. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I don't know if I'm allowed to share that because there's like. Yeah, we actually have some top There's some confidentiality around it. The mm. person that shared this information is still alive mm. and he'd like to remain that way. Yes. <laughs> but it was cold ruthlessness that got him promoted all the way to the top. And now he's president of Russia, you know, essentially dictator in chief, because, you know, he keeps coming back, even though he says it's too soon to tell whether he's going to run again. Mm. Like, yeah, right. Um, um, so to bring it back as we approach um, the end of end of time, the end of all time, the heat death of the universe <laughs> is coming. Um, Seneca says that all the great Stoics would actually applaud change making if it's for the better, for a wiser life. But not if you're obsessed about trying to carry all the luxuries and ease with you. You've got to accept that there will be loss. He says, but if you keep turning around and looking about in order to see how much you may carry away with you and how much money you may keep to equip for the life of leisure, you will never find a way out. No man can swim ashore and take his baggage with him. Mm -hmm. And there will be loss. And this is like a, an ancient motif. There is death before rebirth, the, the snake shedding its skin. Now, it didn't need that old skin anymore, but something is lost. It's funny. Humans will probably keep the old skin. Yeah, like hang it up somewhere. <laughs> and that's the, the problem. Like, and, and I feel like I'm, I'm facing my own moment of this soon in August when my research contract is up and I don't exactly know how I'm going to financially survive. So head over to patreon.com slash V in the D. I uh, mean, yeah, because ideally, to be honest, we have lots of business ideas we want to implement, but mm -hmm. we probably all like throw, throw it away like really quickly if suddenly the, the podcast itself was like a source of enough income to survive in London. Yeah, well, that's what I will want to do. I don't yeah. want to do side ventures and bullshit. No, like, you know, I have business ideas, but I would happily delegate them or wind them down, like, and focus on the podcast for a while because it's so much fun to do. And we feel like... It's it, actually something that's useful and helpful to people. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, the messages we have gotten, like, are way more rewarding than anything else I've ever experienced in any workplace in terms mm. of, like, feedback or anything. Just... People getting in touch saying, thank you so much for that particular episode because X, Y, Z, like, here's what happened in my life. And I'm like, oh, cool. Oh, this is not just a cathartic, I'm getting this off my chest. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> Which you, know. you could fear it is, but this is, you know, we, we, we're doing this with the best of intentions. Mm. So, yeah, I, I also am going to have to face, I guess, in August, that sense of, okay, well, most likely I'm going to have to make do with, with less. But if I want to change and not 
continue down that avenue of life where I was playing by the rules and doing really well, like really well, but it was killing my soul. I'm going to have to lose something in the process. It's going to be a hard valley. Mm. A dark valley. Um, at the end, we get an Easter egg from Epicurus. Um, the words are, everyone goes out of life just as if he had but lately entered it. So that's like, well, we, we come in and we leave. It's all the same. But Seneca goes further and says, actually, we leave it worse. <laughs> he says, he, he, first of all, he thinks it's really fun to taunt the elderly who think themselves important by calling them infants. And he says, but why is it worse that we go out? He says, um, for we are worse when we die than when we were born. But it is our fault and not that of nature. Nature should scold us, saying, What does this mean? I brought you into the world without desires or fears, free from superstition, treachery, and the other curses. Go forth as you were when you entered. It's like, well, you are born... I guess this is the blank slate argument. <laughs> you were born um, this way. Then you took on all of this guilt and freakery and bibed a culture that doesn't necessarily serve you. You had your vices and all of these things. And you're more fucked up at the end than when you began. Well, that's your fault, mate. So says nature. Another direct quote. Okay. I kind of like this in a way, except that for me, more important is the motif of the need for death before rebirth. That as part of what I think we're doing with this podcast, the thing that we're trying to do for ourselves in learning how to human is to try and kill off most of our culturally conditioned, insecure self. Mm in order to be more in touch with who we truly are, what is important on the human level, not like if the bureaucrat represents what society generally is, to be as far away from that as possible. Well, just like in, we must become a phoenix, essentially, because if we, if we evolve rather than uh, die and get rebirth, re reborn, rebirth, mm -hmm. uh, whichever, mm -hmm. um, what we're doing is you know, we're going to see the same things that happen in evolution, such as, you know, snakes have tiny little feet inside their body, vestigial organs. Mm. Those are probably not too bad, you know, but there's things that are present, for example, in humans that are not so useful. Uh, there is a inability to make your own vitamin C mutation, which might have been beneficial during the Ice Age. Mm. But get, guess what? These days it would be so much better if every, if like every other animal on Earth except us, and the hamster, <laughs> okay? So we're in this with the hamsters, guys. We could make vitamin C, you know? If we could, you know, hit a button, like delete the human DNA and restart mm -hmm. again, we would have vitamin C making capabilities. Mm -hmm. But we can't. We have to work with what we've got. But we don't with our brains. I mean, we do to some level, but we've evolved our consciousness to the point where we can try to deconstruct the baggage that we've acquired, unlike a cat, a cat can't sit and go, I'm going to forget the years of abuse before I moved into my foster family. They can't mm -hmm. do that. It takes years of love to try and change them. Whereas we can, if we're clever enough and we study enough, go and go, okay, what are the behaviors that are not serving me? Let's eliminate them. Or let's quit my job cold turkey and start my business venture instead of trying to do both at the same time. Mm. And so we have an opportunity to be Phoenix-like, which is something that normal living creatures do not get the opportunity to do. Powerful motherfucker. Mm. So don't be a soulless monster administrator <laughs> because you guys, you know, really the Holocaust is on your conscience. Be a phoenix. Be a non-genocidal <laughs> phoenix. Yes. Being, so to quote Bojack, being an administrator is uh, literally worse than 100 September 11th. <laughs> <laughs> that was amazing. <laughs> it's paraphrased. He was using it for something else. Or more directly from Rick and Morty, like, shoot, shoot them, Morty, they're robots. He's yeah. like, no, they're not robots. They're bureaucrats. It's a figure of speech. Yeah. Or one more paraphrase from the same episode of Bojack. Uh, I would rather the Holocaust happen every four years, like the Olympics, <laughs> than talk to an administrator. <laughs> Well, it's in a cartoon. You can't blame me for that joke. <laughs> Go watch it on Netflix. So on that high note where we've now shared all of our listeners, but hopefully because they, they've gone to go and have a, a fiery rebirth as the thing that they actually want to be, you can't take it all with you. It's part of the point. You can't pack your house on your back and then go to another place. Unless you're a Viking. 
Unless you're a Viking. Wait, pack your house unless you're a snail, I guess. No, I was thinking more you take it with you after a, death. The Vikings, Viking, you know. Viking snail. Maybe that's the thumbnail for this. <laughs> this is getting weirder. Um, yeah, well, I, I like this one, but yeah. I think it also, it's one of those that leaves me a little uneasy because it actually is pointed and very relevant right now. So yeah, it's more, less of a vague, you know, try to do this when mm. you think about that. It's more of a, are you doing what you're supposed to be doing right now? So tell us, are you people, like Dre said, write us a nice review on, on iTunes and send a screenshot and ask us a question and uh, we can become your unbureaucratic actual mirrors. Mm -hmm. Are you working with a narcissist? Maybe we can tell you. And as we are trying to expand our Instagram, I mean, obviously, if you want to email it, email it. But how about if you want to send us that screenshot and have a conversation with us, you do so via our Instagram account, vindhed.pod. Dot pod. Yes. Okay. And uh, until next time. Please be silly, be kind, and be weird.